Good morning, everybody. How is everybody on day two? <laughs> Excellent. We haven't woken up yet, but hopefully, you know, this panel's going to give you a bit of a, a warming up on uh, a cold December morning. Um, so, just to obviously give you guys a bit of an idea, I'm going to obviously. My name's Michael. I'm uh, CEO of uh, Unbound. I've obviously been preparing for this panel, so uh, you can thank all my team for the fantastic event that we've been putting on so far. Um, I want to obviously start by introducing the panel. Um, we've got. Uh, a lot of things that are going on. Uh, I don't want to get into any more trouble for uh, delaying uh, our day any further. Um, so, obviously, first I want to introduce um, uh, Anna um, from Emerald Street. Hello. Uh, we've got Demo here from Field. Hi. Uh, Stephanie from Mystery Vibe. Hello. Who's got the best title, I think, that anybody has in this room. <laughs> yep. Uh, and Tyrone as well from uh, Badoink VR. How's it going? I do want to know how you came up with that name, <laughs> but we can discuss that later. Um, I think what I want to do is obviously just go through you guys and you can all introduce what you do and a little bit more detail and enlighten obviously the audience. Um, so, Anna, let's uh, start with you. Hi, nice to see you all. You all look slightly ultraviolet from here, but it's kind of cool. Um, I am Anna Fielding. I'm the editor of Emerald Street, as you can see behind me. It's a daily women's lifestyle publication uh, published via email. So effectively, in a nutshell, I'm a journalist. I'm doing the social commentary bits here. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Dimo. I'm the founder of Field, uh, which was well known as the first threesome app, which later evolved as a platform for couples, singles, to in, in general, humans to explore their sexuality. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what I do. Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm one of the co-founders of Mystery Vibe. Um, we design, develop, manufacture luxury pleasure products. Um, the first one being a highly personalizable vibrator called Crescendo, um, which is not just personalizable in the way that it's physicality, so you can bend it to take lots of different shapes. Um, you can also program it, so it's the world's first platform vibrator. I'm Tyrone, I am the Director of Communications for Badoink VR, and we are in the adult entertainment business, uh, specifically VR porn. Uh, we've been around for about 10 years now. In the past two years, we focused on strictly uh, virtual reality porn, and I head up uh, all the marketing for the company. Excellent. That well, all sounds very interesting, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so, I mean, look, I mean, obviously, just to engage you guys a little bit, who's uh, been involved with any sort of digital love relationship sort of uh, applications? Put your hands up. Anybody? No? Only a few of you? I mean, this is a $30 billion industry and only two, three of you have been involved. Okay, fair enough. Um, I think what we want to try and do is, I, I want, look, I want to obviously ask these guys a little bit how it's changed, I think, in the last five years, how we've seen, um, obviously, relationships, uh, obviously dating, that sort of stuff changing over the last five years or so. I think there's been a bit of a big shift. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting to understand, obviously, from yourselves, how you've obviously been engaged with that, how you've seen, obviously, the old market grow, um, and how you've seen it develop a little bit. So, um, if you uh, want to start, Stephanie? Yeah, sure. Um, so, the funny thing is, is we actually came up with the idea for Mystery Vibe a very long time ago. It was about eight years ago, and me and my co-founders, we all come from very mainstream corporate backgrounds. Um, management consultants, a mixture of kind of Google, Microsoft, Deloitte, uh, Nokia, BE, and we saw this uh, this real trend. Um, but I think, like you say, there's been this huge, deep shift in terms of people's attitudes over the last, I'd say, a few years. Yeah. Um, I mean, just any, a very obvious example of that is the Fifty Shades phenomenon that spread so quickly. And it was one of the first times that at least I personally would see people sitting on the bus on the tube reading this thing which everyone knew was overtly sexual. Um, and I think you really see the power of um, when something sexual becomes normalized and very mainstream, and it, it just was huge. Um, so I think we've seen this real fundamental shift, and we are, it's continuing, um, change towards more liberal attitudes, um, and I think that's only a good thing. Mm. So Anna, would you say that it's become a little bit more acceptable? Is this uh, something that's, I don't know, the, the world is allowed to now see as a, as, a, as a social sort of acceptance in this sort of way? 
Um, I think it depends what you're talking about. I think we've become much more open in talking about sex itself, and we've become much more open and liberal, and I will say correct, in our attitudes towards different sexualities as well, of all kinds. Um, the one thing I will say is I think that the culture has shifted to something that's slightly more puritanical now. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. because of a digital thing where things have become slightly commodified. Um, you do, compared to my generation, I'm in my late 30s, I find that people who are 10, 15 years younger than me have a similar attitude to sex to people who are 10 or 15 years older than me. I feel that my sort of latter part of Gen X is a very kind of sexually permissive, you were never called slutty, you could sleep with who you wanted generation. Um, and I find that people who are younger than me, whilst they may still be having sex, they don't seem as able to talk about it except within the privacy of their phones. So I think there's a certain layer of distance that's imposed by technology rather than meeting someone in a bar and going home with them. You can almost do it covertly by meeting them on Tinder and going straight round to their house. So I think there's, there's a bit of both. I think there's a great opening and a flourishing of being able to talk about things, especially actually in a mediated space. Um, you know, I think our media is much more able to talk about sex, but I am slightly slightly unsure that it's become a thing across all of society. Okay, that's interesting. And um, Dino, obviously from your side of things, yours is a little bit more of a, on a multiple sort of level. So these are sort of taboos that obviously were never something so much open in the past, but obviously field sort of allows this thing to sort of be created. How do you, uh, I don't know, how, how do you find that that sort of develops in, in, in the last over few years? Uh, I've been into business for the last two, so I can't talk about the, <laughs> the past 30, I'm just 25. But um, <laughs> um, look, we kind of made the whole thing without market research, without any kind of research. The only research we did is with um, me and my girlfriend. We, we did research online, we couldn't find anything that resonated with us. All the, you know, all these products had these um, old school labels, swingers, um, sex parties, whatever. Like they had these kind of um, identities which did not resonate with us. So, um, sp speaking from my experience, um, it's, it's just that that openness came naturally to our relationship. Uh, out of curiosity, and we didn't have labels, we didn't have anything, so we decided to make something and see if other people were gonna uh, find it interesting and um, in a way useful, but um, we kind of encourage people to experience and be open to experiences, because mm -hmm. um, you see what happens to like 99% of the dating industry is kind of masked around connecting people for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, we take this more open approach saying, you look like human sexuality and uh, your kinks might not be kinky at all. It's, it's just you don't see them anywhere. You don't, you don't, um, you know, when you watch movies, you see these heroes and uh, you envy and stuff, but you don't see the, the other part of their life. You only see the, maybe the career, the, the family life. Nobody is showing you their sex life, at least not in its full color. It's just mm. kind of hints. You might have like a one minute sex scene in a movie or something. So we kind of grow, all growing up in this environment where we see successful people we want to be like them and uh, you don't see that other part of their life, and you're like, oh, maybe something's wrong with me. And now we have field where you can come and connect and see, and maybe you match with someone, you see someone like yourself there, and that's how we normalize stuff, um, at least in my head. <laughs> nice. No, I, I, you know, I, I don't think you can disagree or agree with these sort of things. I think it's everybody's an individual, and this is how obviously these things are put together. So, Tyro, obviously, it's a little bit different in, in terms of obviously Bedoik's technology, VR, um, how I think of it anyway. You'll probably tell me something a little bit different. Um, obviously, it's more of the solo experience, um, you know, obviously putting something on and being in a world of your own, uh, uh, not so much imagination, but reality, uh, or virtual reality as it is. Um, so how do you feel, obviously, the social impact of that is sort of working as well? Are people moving towards the solo um, sort of experimentation, um, is that really building as well? Yeah, I mean, 
I think the way we look at VR porn is it's, it's a completely different experience than traditional porn. Um, traditional porn is more, you're more of a voyeur, you're not really an active participant in what's going on. With VR, it's actually a much more intimate experience because you're put into a role and you assume someone else's body and you're actually looking at the performer and you're looking to, into their eyes and there's an intimacy that uh, didn't really exist in traditional porn and I think for that, um, you know, we're still learning how to shoot it, how performers are to perform in it, and they perform differently because it is a different experience. So, yes, it is a solo experience and you are kind of blocked off, but at the same time, you have an interaction with the performers that you didn't have before with, with traditional porn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as time goes on, it's becoming more and more mainstream. We kind of look at ourselves, in addition to be an entertainment company, we're a tech technology company, and we're really blazing a trail, not just in porn, but also in virtual reality. So we've been around for, you know, a couple of years now. You know, other VR companies, whether it be film or gaming, they're not making money. A lot of the stuff they do is just in demo phase. So we're really blazing a trail and really kind of setting a path for uh, a new language in virtual reality, and it just happens to be in porn. Excellent. Okay, now that's very interesting, because I mean, like, from my side of things, you know, there is, uh, I, I think to pose the question, are we, I mean, I, I don't know, it's, this, this could be a very open question, but are we sort of enhancing ourselves in terms of, uh, our, you know, the, the, our sexual relationships or our relationships going forward, or are we substituting? And I think that's where, you know, it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, you know, what are we doing? Are we moving into a world where we are sort of making things a little bit easier for ourselves, bit because we're busy, we're obviously with work and dedicating ourselves to our lives? Um, or are we actually enhancing ourselves in this sort of way? I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't really, it's not the same, you know, I, and I, I, I hear that a lot. People say, you know, if you're doing VR porn, are you, are you cheating on your girlfriend? No, I mean, it, it's a different experience and it's not meant to replace love or sex. It's just, um, if anything, it's a way to, uh, you know, gives you a safe haven to experience a sexual experience that you normally wouldn't be able to experience. And by no means is that supposed to be a replacement. If anything, it's an augmentation. And it gives you, you know, a safe haven to practice something that you normally probably wouldn't feel comfortable doing maybe with someone else or, um, you know, if you, we have this new thing called virtual uh, sexology, which is actually aimed to make you be a better lover. So we worked with a sex therapist who will actually run you through a number of different exercises, breathing exercises, Kegel exercises, and it's really designed to make you feel more comfortable, to give you more control over your sex life, so that when you are intimate with, you know, an actual human being, you, um, you have the confidence and you have the knowledge to, to be a better lover. Brilliant. So what time's the sex workshop today? I'm sure there's going to be a training session for the people here. Um, it's not cheating either, by the way, so that's also uh, an interesting... But everyone, could I... So, sorry. Oh, I just think the interesting thing is that this kind of technology is, is prompting us to ask these kinds of questions. Like, what it, how do we see fidelity, and how is technology changing that very human construct? And I think when we're talking about enhancing, someone asked me the question the other day, because we, we talk in technology a lot about disruption, right? And someone came up to me and they said, what are you actually disrupting? And that question threw me slightly, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I thought, the more I thought about it, the more I thought within this space, at least, I didn't like the word disruption, because it connotes some kind of um, disconnection or distraction. Um, whereas for me, at least, personally, I, I see, and the role of sex tech as facilitating communication and facilitating connection rather than disrupting. It's all about enhancing and augmenting an experience. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents on that. No, absolutely. I don't know if I'll make it out of here alive for saying this on the stage, but I think disruption is a bloody ridiculous word. It's been so divorced from its actual meaning by the tech industry that um, duck and cover. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Tyrone, I wanted to ask you actually, um, because most tech products, the core of them is good design, and um, Stephanie is obviously very much something that's very tuned to the feminine body. Um, I wondered, because I read something, and I was fascinated to know if things have moved on since I read the article, that um, 
women were having a bit of trouble with VR porn because of the headsets not being quite right and it being quite orientated towards a male experience, mm -hmm. whether gay or straight, but still quite male orientated. I was wondering if like, the industry had moved on from there right. at all. Or... Yeah, you know, I mean, I think the biggest problem right now is, you know, it's still very early. Um, the technology needs to improve. I mean, the headsets are effective, but they're big, they're bulky, and that's not a male-female thing, that's just a human thing. Um, but also, as far as content goes, it's definitely catered more towards men. And that's, be that's just because it's men who are buying it. Um, but that being said, I think there's a huge opportunity to cater more towards women, especially with VR. Um, but I think what people are starting to understand that it's different, you know, women experience sex differently, they want something differently. So what you would shoot for a man, so for example, you know, when there's a male POV, the man just, if you're, if you're a male, you just want the actor to be still because you don't want to lose the interaction. So the woman does all the work and you're just kind of sitting there. But for a woman, for you, if you're just to sit there, it kind of feels a little bit more violating if you're not able to move. So women actually would prefer their AVR is basically what it is to actually be interacting. And, um, you know, they would prefer their sex, and I, I'm not necessarily generalizing, but there is a difference between what women want and what men want. And I think, um, you know, as we put content out there and we hear back from our users, we're starting to learn that. And hopefully, as the market grows and more women actually start making uh, VR porn, which it, it is happening, the content's gonna adjust with that as well. And that's starkly different from, you know, traditional porn, because traditional porn is, honestly very misogynistic and you know it's it's completely different experience in that you do have the ability to tell a story differently and i think that will open up to a broader audience including women yeah i think what's interesting in this space is that um we can really start to look at the data more in depth and kind of come to i mean for example i i love every year when pornhub puts out their data about what people are searching, where in the world, and they just they put it out there free for everyone to look at. And for me, that kind of insight into what people are looking for and what they desire and what they want to watch is fascinating. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes it can really challenge some of our assumptions that we hold about um, certain people liking a particular type of content. Um, I think going forward, it's like understanding a little bit more about that kind of what people like and what people are looking for will help us to create better content as as young companies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think that's very different to in the past when there may not have been that much focus on data. I think we can now really start to understand what people what people are looking for. Um, so so with that sort of data, I mean, <clears throat> would you say there's opportunities now for? I mean, I'm sure there is at the moment. I know places like Pornhub have a lot of advertising space, but would you say that a lot of people? A lot of companies, corporates, media agencies are buying up this sort of ad space that, you know, it's a $30 billion industry, as we just said before. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to get involved with, you know, these sort of areas of advertising, getting to the consumer correctly. Um, and what is sort of the ROI on that? What is the social impact of that? You know, people being related with this sort of industry. Is that, how is that moving? How are you finding this moving? I think advertising in this space is a minefield. <laughs> um, one, sex companies can't advertise. For, uh, we, I couldn't go and place an ad there on Facebook um, because of simply what we do. Um, so that's a little bit interesting. But I read this hilarious, fascinating post. Uh, I can't remember exactly which company it was. It was a food company in the US that decided, hey, we're going to put some adverts on, on porn sites. Um, and it was one of the best campaigns they've ever run. And uh, they run this, they wrote this huge blog post. I think if you search like food porn advert, it'll, it'll probably come up. Um, it was, it was, it's a hilarious and an amazing insight into this. They just said, hey, sex, food, they go together, right? Um, so they created these, um, these amazing adverts and it was one of the best advertising campaigns they'd run. Uh, so I think people, don't really look at this industry and say, hey, let's advertise there. But I think there's, there's many opportunities. And I think as, as people start to realize that sex is a part of everyone's life, everyone does it, people don't talk about it, but everyone does it. Um, and people start to open up to things like advertising on, um, on more mainstream spaces, there's gonna be huge opportunities for brands. I think it's really where each brand personally sees its brand values lying. Um, I mean, 
you know, there are brands that would be happy to advertise on Pornhub that would pull their ads from Breitbart. And it's, so it's kind of like, where, what's your moral view? Where's, where's your brand positioning? Um, I mean, I know which side I'd fall, and it's on this sofa. But uh, uh, quite literally, oh, that's, that sounds terrible, actually. In this oh, topic, no. it? They're um, nice sofas. <laughs> they are. Uh, the publication I work for and edit is completely ad-funded, so it's something that we come a lot. Um, from the opposite thing, it's actually quite difficult for us to, to, at the moment to take uh, any kind of sex advertising or even run that much sexualized content because we're email published. And a lot of people, if we even swear, uh, it gets stuck in people's firewall filters. So there are, I think there are still things where other aspects of technology need to catch up with the time lag if it's going to be a kind of proper seamless and integrated thing. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, because I think, uh, you know, obviously there's, there is, as I say again, it's a, th it's, it's a huge industry. Gambling and pornography are the two biggest industries that are going, really. Um, and obviously it's, it's never going to be a dying sort of industry, which is obviously good that you obviously guys are going to be very much involved. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of obviously yourself, I mean, how do you, do you have a, a monetary sort of... Uh, uh, method at the moment, you have a way of obviously doing it, you have subscription base, is this how it works? Yeah, it's all subscription um, and it works well, we're kind of focused on um, not putting any ads anywhere, uh, it's just kind of bring more value to people so they see value in it and uh, that's, that's how we are pushing it together forward. Anyway, uh, the thing with the porn though, it's really interesting. I, uh, me and my girl tried that VR thing, and the thing she said was, "Oh, that so that's how men feel like, <laughs> you know? Uh, you just you're standing still, and everything happens, right? And um, and maybe later on with some more sensors and stuff on your body, you can actually feel the whole thing. So we can switch roles and actually experience what the other person is experiencing." Um, and it's, it's going to be a really interesting field. Um, we tried VR uh, to make an app with VR. It's not ready yet, so it's not ready on so many levels, but whoever taps on it right now is going to win for the next 10 years, but I don't think a screen in front of your eyes is, is actually the future. Um, uh, I don't know. We'll see. But our app is doing well. I don't have any complaints. Um, I'm just trying to keep it really honest because what I have experienced with other dating apps is that the business side of things, you know, it's kind of the, I think they hire the same marketing people, the same copywriters to write down everything. Uh, so I mean, you've that's why. You've changed your name recently, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, we've changed the name. We actually, since the, the name, the change of the name, we kind of, the, the whole rebrand, because it wasn't just the name. Um, I was invited here. Uh, I was uh, invited at another uh, conference and so many places. So I guess the previous name was actually holding us back. Um, it's funny what a, a, a fresh branding can do to your business. You know, if a threesome app was holding you down, but the media was loving it, you know, uh, and then you have to change. The media doesn't love you that much. You're not that age anymore, but uh, society accepts you. You know. It's funny. That's good. That's, it's very interesting. Um, and so, obviously, from, from yourself, it's, uh, as you say, it is a subscription-based model. And then in terms of advertising and things like that, you, you work with any of these sort of companies you have? We don't advertise anywhere. I think we actually advertise on Google, but it's... Uh. How, how do you find that as well, obviously, restrictions in terms of, obviously, you know, calling it a, a relationship app or... a digital sex app, or however, obviously, the, the category sort of sits. How do you find that? Is there restrictions on Google or Facebook? Or, I mean, well, how do you get around it as well? <laughs> it really depends who really wants your money and how much money you have. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, some have um, high moral barriers, you know, like old school moral barriers uh, when doing business. Um, in fact, I was actually refused to rent a, a flat in London because of my business, uh, which is mind-blowing. Um, and uh, we don't advertise, like Facebook is cutting us down uh, at the same time. You see some... What's funny is like sex is being denied across digital for a really long time. Um, 
and at the same time, people don't have problems with violence, gambling, alcohol. Um, even like cigarettes are back in the movies if you have watched the latest TV series you know, on Netflix and stuff. And I'm like, what's, what's happening to this world? Like that, that sexuality and pleasure is such a normal thing. You have it since, like, I don't know. I've been, I've been into it from a really young age. And thanks to porn, I was like, oh my God. Because where I come from, I'm from Bulgaria. Education there usually sucks. And sexual education doesn't exist. And you don't have much choice. You know, you just go online, you find stuff. Am I being somehow damaged because of <coughs> doing it at early age? I don't think so. I think I'm a pretty well-functioning human being. <laughs> Excellent. No, that's good. And guys, how, how, again, with yourselves, I mean, how do you find, obviously, advertising, marketing, how does that sort of work for you guys? Is it, is it something that is just self-propelled from word of mouth, or is there ways of, obviously, advertising and branding yourselves differently from, say, other people or whichever? Yeah, I would say there's still a lot of stigma and taboos within, you know, the advertising agencies. Most brands, most media outlets, from an advertising perspective, don't want to touch it with a tinfoil pole. And that's just, you know, traditional values. I think, you know, religion has a lot to do with it because in gambling's the same way. Um, so most of our marketing opportunities are through public relations because on the flip side, from an editorial perspective, it's become very mainstream now. And you see major outlets talking about porn, talking about sex tech uh, almost every day, whether it be Huffington Post, Mashable, Fortune, because they know people are very interested in it, and in this day and age in social media, it's getting clicks. So they keep covering it more and more and more because they know it's popular. So I think it'll be a while before um, you know those traditional attitudes change from an advertising perspective, and that'll always be a challenge. Um, and we just have to find other ways to, to market ourselves. Mm. And yourself, Stephanie? Yeah, I very much agree with that. Um, I, th I, think, I think what's missing from the conversation at the moment is pleasure. Um, I think uh, from a young age, even when we look at sex, ed sex education, it's all very much focused on um, what body part goes where and when, um, and things like pregnancy and STI and use a condom. Um, but we don't actually talk about the fact that sex should be a pleasurable thing. Um, and even when we go forward and we start talking about sex in the media, as we get older, it's all things like, here's five tips to give your boyfriend a blowjob, or here's 10 new ways that you could do this particular kind of thing. And it's just, we always focus on actions rather than actually on pleasure. And I think there's this, there's a huge um, gap in terms of the conversation, um, which again, I think is a massive opportunity for people to create very engaging, very progressive, very open and honest content around that space that really resonates with people. Um, I mean, sex, every, like I say, everyone does it. Um, so when you start talking about some of these issues, there is something in the conversation that will resonate with people. And I think there's this massive opportunity to talk about pleasure um, as this concept, rather than just talking about sex or relationships and, and segmenting them out. Um, yeah, that's my kind of thoughts on advertising and marketing in the space. Mm. Uh, or at least like, and when we're talking about the media. For me, that's, that's still missing, almost. Yeah. And I, you agree, Anna? You, um, you, you see, obviously, obviously, with your magazine as well. Not say, I don't want to point out your magazine to doing things right or wrong. Um, but in terms of, obviously, that sort of editorial space, um, how are you seeing that these things are sort of being promoted or advertised or spoken about? I think, um, I mean, ours is quite a tricky one because, because, because it's email delivery, so we, we have to sort of shy away from certain subjects just because of uh, other people's blockers. But um, within the women's media as a whole, it, it very much is publication by publication, although I think there is a shift towards a kind of more female-centric, it should be fun, it should be happy thing. I think one of the things is when people have been talking about teaching about consent recently, it's like, no, don't just have consent, hold out for enthusiasm. Um, there's been, yeah, I know exactly what you mean, that terrible Cosmo thing of, like, give a better blowjob. Um, sorry, Cosmo, but that's, it is always them. Uh, 
I think there are spaces now that are opening up that are more open and more frank. Um, you know, there are publications, very mainstream publications for younger women like The Debrief. Uh, there are people that you would expect to be edgy but are bringing really quality reporting to it, like Vice Media's Broadly. Um, and that's just in Britain. I think, you know, if you look at publications like Jezebel in the States, there's, there's a lot now where the conversation is changing. And it's actually one of the few parts of journalism where I think internet commenting has been really valuable because then you do get people talking together and you do get communities sharing stories and experiences. And I think that's really valuable in that space as well. Excellent, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, no, so it's, it is quite interesting. I think you see a lot more, you know, racy sort of advertisements and things like that on sides of buses and on TV now, which I think does capture a lot of interest. I think that's, you know, the way these things are sort of moving. Um, so, I mean, from my side of things, I mean, what I'm quite interested in now is as well, what, what, what's the future? I mean, what are we, where are we going? Where are we going with this? I mean, what's happening going forward? I mean, for example, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, your two companies should combine together and obviously offer a dual experience. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> and then obviously, you know, these are the sort of things. So, I mean, are people doing this? Is this happening? Is this something that's moving forward? I mean, I, you know, I'm not creating it myself here, but, you know, please tell me. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that is the next step. Um, companies like ours working together, um, you know, for us specifically, VR, you have the visual, the next step is obviously going to be touch. So um, that has started to happen on some level. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with teledildonics, but um, it's something that Bedoink is getting into where, uh, you know, they have a male masturbatory, de masturbatory device that syncs up to the video that, you know, what you're watching on screen, you can actually feel in the same time. Um, and that's through a partnership with a company called Kairu. So as the technology gets better, I think that, uh, you know, combining all the senses is the next step. I don't, I don't know if you want to add smell to that, but that's probably be the final frontier. But it's really kind of giving users the full immersion experience, sight, uh, sound, and, and then touch, I think, is the next step. Do you agree, Stephanie? Yeah, definitely. I think we're moving much more towards kind of like multi-sensorial experiences, and that's something that we're incredibly interested in, something that very much inspired us right when we started, when we had that idea eight years ago, we wanted to create these immersive experiences that are designed to kind of let, let you let go of your day, your busy, stressful day, and, and switch on when it comes to your pleasure. Um, I think uh, something for me that's incredibly important and something which I would encourage everyone in this room to do is to start thinking, um, start thinking maybe slightly differently about sex tech. Like we're saying, uh, a lot of the articles focus on those tips and they're very action focused rather than talking about some of the underlying questions and what this kind of technology will do in terms of how we connect as humans. Um, for me, it's, it's more important, instead of asking what a p particular piece of sex technology does, it's more important to ask how it makes you feel. And I think we can very much start having the conversations around how do we create content that is diverse and um, great for people of all different genders and whatever. Um, and how do we encourage how do we encourage that kind of content to be made and also distributed? Um, how do we encourage more? And I, I would say actually sex tech is one of the areas of technology where there is a very strong uh, female drive in terms of female founders. Um, but how do we encourage more women as well to um, join this particular space and join technology more broadly, coming up with content, being behind the camera, um, doing, how do, we, how do we get more women into tech more broadly? Because I think once, we, once we're a very, a very diverse community, and I, I think we're getting there, like we're not there, but we're getting there, and we'll start to create more uh, stuff in the future that is more diverse. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, just obviously with your side of things, the future of obviously how something like Field would work, I mean, in comparison to, say, how this technology is working, I mean, how, where, do you still see there's a, a future for human interaction in terms of, well, on multiple sort of levels, <laughs> um, rather than it being, say, something in a virtual reality world where it's quick, it's easy, it's inexpensive, you know, I mean, are people still... Uh, well, it really depends where we are 
going as a human race, you know, if we are still going to chase our careers in the next hundred years, or we're going to move to some more spiritual, I don't know, society, it really depends. But technology is always going to make things exciting. That's, that's why sex tech got born, you know, like Uber, um, like the whole on-demand thing uh, happened through uh, technology, right? Like now you can, you can have quick access to whatever you want. I can even send a mail when a guy will come and pick my mail and send it for me and all this kind of stuff. So it's the same with sex, you know, if porn was something you were not interested in before, now you have a VR, so why not try porn? If uh, sex toys were not your thing, now you have connected sex toys, so why don't you try that? And if, uh, I don't know, sexting or... Uh, uh, no, it's re for us, it was really hard to, to, as a couple to find someone to talk to who's, who's looking for couples or who's generally open to talk about sex. Most of our friends are like really separate these th two things in their lives. So I see the future, like, I see it open as, of course, it's that's, uh, you know, natural evolution. I think it's, it's, we've been suppressing this and I think government helped a lot to not be sexually open for a really long time, banning everything they don't understand because um, that's the easiest way out, you know, they just criminalize stuff, face sitting, whatever. Doof, doof, doof. Um, That's true, actually. I am slightly terrified by that, the, the digital economy thing of banning yeah. certain kinds of forms. It's crazy. Do you think how much pressure you put on society? Like, there might be really useful people in this society in London, like bankers and entrepreneurs who are into these things. And now, you, what, you're going to make them 50% less useful to the society because you're imposing some... Um, I don't know, in, in the name of protecting our children is the most ridiculous thing ever because um, children are going to find whatever they want to find, you know. Whatever you hide from them, they're going to find it. And that thing in the name of the children is a really disgusting way of hiding what you really want to do because this way you can go and start wars in, in the names of children, you know, because this is what society really cares about, their future, you know. So they're being really protective and they're like, oh, if it's for our children, then it should not be allowed anywhere. And, uh, we, and I think because of the way we do business and our branding and so on and so on and their branding and, and what they do, and if governments cannot help people to be more sexually aware, companies can, you know? We, we, we live in a, in a world where we, we can create a company and follow our dream and, and, and bring people with us. In our case, it's, we currently have around two million people. And if, if we keep uh, growing like that, in, in some point, it might become a discrimination to a certain uh, level of our uh, world, you know, like, um, it's like saying no to black people, Asian people, short people, long people, skinny people, whatever, you know, the same way saying no to a, a certain sexual act, you know, it's, um, or being generally curious about these things, and technology helps a lot, makes things interesting, and that's my... Vision. Good. No, I think it's a fantastic view. I think it's right. I mean, you know, uh, well, in my opinion, I think, you know, we're all being a bit more open-minded um, and more accepting society. Everybody's built differently, and this is uh, the way the future's going. Um, I think that's all we've got time for today. Um, look, guys, if anybody wants to obviously catch up with these, I'm sure you've got millions of questions. Um, I mean, I've asked obviously a lot of mine. Um, they're obviously going to be around today. You can obviously experience some of the different uh, technologies that are in our startup bazaar. Um, I would recommend. They are interesting and uh, quite fun at the same time. Um, but yes, um, thank you guys, all of you, uh, for obviously being here. Um, and yeah, I think that's, uh, we've, we've, that's a wrap, really. Thanks very much. Thank you.